Hello. Welcome you all to Postcolonial Space to our weekly webinar. I'm, of course, Masood Raja. You all know me. So I had set this topic today on Tayyip Saleh's book, Season of Migration to the North, Al Mosum Al Hijra, Il Al Shamal, because uh, a couple of people on the channel had requested me to record something on it. And I told them that I'll reread the novel and then maybe record something. So I thought maybe it would be better if we had a conversation about it. And that way, we will probably have a more interactive response to the novel where your opinions and your questions can be incorporated within my take on the novel. Now, I've never taught uh, Season of Migration to the North, but now that I've reread it, I would love to teach it one day, maybe pretty soon. So that's what we are going to talk about today, Season of Migration to the North. And uh, the way I want to set it up is first, I would like to give my understanding of it, of the plot, of the main characters, what are my personal thoughts about the novel and why. And then we can open up to a question answer session and see what you all have to say about it. That's the way I'm planning it. But, uh, you know, you can all let me know what you think. And as always, I'll be looking for your comments in the comment section and then responding to them. And as you join in, please let me know through the comments that you're here. And uh, that way, I know how many people have joined in. Sorry. So as you come in, let me first uh, mention a little bit about Tayyib Saleh, one of the greatest Sudanese authors, right? And uh, mostly famous for this one novel, but also a collection of short stories and other works. Most of his works are set in the rural community of Northern Sudan. And Sudan, as you know, it is considered, was considered the largest Muslim majority country until it got divided into North and South Sudan. And it has a really interesting history. And that history is connected, of course, to the history of Egypt, as well as history of the British Empire. If you look on the map, Egypt is to the north of Sudan. And our story is set in the northern Sudan, north of Khartoum, in a small village, right? And it's crucial to also understand that that's where the Nile flows through. And that's really important to keep in mind. Our story is set somewhere in the mid 50s and late 50s, right? And it is mostly set in a rural community, Muslim rural community of Northern Sudan. These are farming people and villagers who till their own lands and depend on the river for, of course, most of their irrigation and everything else. Now, the plot is interesting, and that is we have an unnamed narrator who has just returned from England after having finished his education in humanities because he wrote something about, you know, an obscure poet. He has just returned to his village. That's the opening scene. And he has taken a steamer from Khartoum to his village. And the entire village is there to welcome him. He's returning after seven years. And as he meets people, he knows most of them, but he also meets a stranger whose, whose name is Mustafa Saeed. 
And that is what kind of gives us a hint that it's a modernist novel. Remember, as so many scholars would tell you, at the heart of a modernist novel is a mystery, a secret, right? And what drives your reading is to find that secret. So the dominant strain of most modernist novels is epistemological. The question usually is, can I trust the narrator? And if I do, what is it that this novel is going to reveal to me? So pretty soon then, we as readers become curious about Mustafa Saeed, right? This is the story of Mustafa Saeed and not our narrator, even though he figures prominently. Then through the course of the novel, we get to know Mustafa Saeed some of it from his own account, what he tells the narrator, the letter that he writes the narrator, and what the narrator finds in the secret room that he had left the key to, right, to our narrator. But most of what we learn about Mustafa Saeed is what other people's opinions were about him from the public record of his trial, right, and his own account of what kind of life he has lived. And, and, and a picture of him emerges in our mind, in our consciousness as a person. So that's what drives the narrative. We trying to find out what our narrator is going to find out about Mustafa Saeed. And it is, of course, caught within the web of the local culture, its history, Sudan itself, right? It's geography, the desert, the Nile, but also it's colonial history. All of those things are in so many ways determining for us as to how to experience the story, how to read the story. And we'll talk a little more about it. Now, here is what I will caution against. We have developed this tendency, especially in the post colonies, to always talk about post colonial texts with reference to their European counterparts. I've read quite a few essays that, oh, he's doing a reversal of Conrad. He is retelling the story of Sudan from the Sudanese point of view. I mean, there is no doubt in the novel that it is tracing the impact of people's life through the colonial trauma and also in the post-colonial nation state. But to just simply assume that Tayyip Saleh is somehow using Heart of Darkness as an analog and then telling an Arab story, I think it does a disservice to Tayyip Saleh himself. Okay, I mean, Tayyip Saleh can tell a story. He doesn't need to make it, you know, analogous or analogous or whatever you want to call it to, he doesn't need heart of darkness to tell a story, okay? And we should not fall for that tendency all the time that somehow it's a rewriting. It could just be an original story, right? Even though it deals with questions of colonialism and colonial identity. The second mistake that we must not make is to read one or two characters as a representation of the Sudanese culture or the Arab culture or the African culture, okay? There are hints in the novel where it is pretty clear, and I will point to that, that it teaches us that whatever Mustafa Saeed does may have had something to do with his experience as a colonial subject, but it also has a lot to do with him being a psychologically damaged person, okay? And so in that sense, then, instead of reading him as an outcome of a colonial experience, which makes the colonial experience an over-determining feature, and makes him into the malehood of Sudan, we could also read it just like we read in any other European novels when one person transgresses, 
has mental illnesses, we deal with it as a mental illness, right? Or as a flaw, right? So keep that in mind. In my opinion, if you read Mustafa Said's actions and writings and his self-description, he comes across to me more as an existentialist, right? Closer to Albert Camus, the stranger, than to Heart of Darkness and Kurtz. That is my reading of that, and I can explain it further. So these are some of my thoughts about the novel. Now, one thing, and um, you can put me wise on it. I have not read it in Arabic, right? But the translation, right? Even though it's an English translation, one thing comes across beautifully to us, right? That this is a beautifully written story, right? And I think there is a reason that Tayyib Saleh, who was fluent in English as well as in Arabic, that he decided to write it in Arabic, right? And someday I do hope to read it in Arabic and understand it because I think only then will I be able to capture the whole story. Okay. So I have plot is pretty simple. Our narrator has come back from England after his higher education. He's gone back to his village Right? He will eventually end up working for the newly freed Sudanese government as a civil servant. But he's visiting his village. And while he's visiting his village, we are introduced to certain character. We are introduced characters. We are introduced to his childhood friend, Majub, who works in the fields, is slightly um, high school educated, but who is active in the politics right, local politics. We meet his grandfather, who is, uh, a, you know, a resilient figure in the novel. And we meet um, Mustafa Said, his wife, Hosna, right? Uh, we meet Binti Majzub, right? The older woman who hangs out with his grandfather, uh, Bakri. And then we meet Wadrais, right, who is part of the climactic ending of the story arc. Right? These are the people we meet. And then the story, part of it is we trying to follow the path of our narrator, which is peripheral to the main story, because he goes to the city, he has children, and you know he gets married. But then there is this interspersing of information about Mustafa Said and then his death and he leaving his children and his wife in the care of our narrator. And then the forceful marriage of his widow Hosna with Wad Rais and she refusing it and finally killing him and killing herself. That's the climactic ending, right? And then our narrator at the end goes back, opens the secret vault and finds out that Mustafa Said had created in that room, a European room with all his conquests there, women, the four women who killed himself because of themselves because of him and the murder of his wife. And the last scene where our narrator, driven mad by his sense of loss over Hosna's death, but also maybe despair jumps into the river, maybe to commit suicide, but at the last moment, the last lines of the novel are help, help. He has decided he's going to live. So he's struggling to get back. And we know that he's already close to the river bank because he can see the water mills, right? And that also is a modernist ending, right? Because, you know, it's unresolved. We hope that he makes it. We hope that he lives a meaningful life. So that's roughly the plot. I will go into the details of Mustafa Said's character and some other details in the novel in a minute, and then hope to answer all your, not all your questions, but any questions that you have. But let me welcome people. So Infinita, welcome. Uh, 
Oshin Wani, Oshin, welcome. I guess you had suggested that I should do a lecture on this. And then Spurthi, uh, welcome again. Uh, all my usual suspects are here. And I'm going to see if there are any other comments. So before I go into like some further details of the novel, a little bit about Sudan. Right. The way the Sudanese become embroiled in the British imperialism was that after the British established themselves in Egypt, right, they also then try to establish control over Sudan. So they come down from the north, and as they are progressing towards Khartoum, of course, by 1881, the Mahdi of Sudan, right, Muhammad Ahmad, had already established his control over most of the Sudan of Sudan. Now, the concept of the Mahdi is really interesting. It comes from the Hadith, Hadith tra tradition. And the idea behind it is that at the end of times, a Mahdi, a savior will rise from amongst the Muslims and he will be given the mission to prepare the world and to unite the world in preparation for the arrival, for the second coming, coming of Jesus. Okay, remember, Jesus will come back. Because in the Muslim tradition, he is the only prophet who doesn't die but was lifted up. But the technical aspect of it is before our Christian brothers and sisters like revel in it is that he will come back as a Muslim, okay, to unite the world. So the concept of the Mahdi was always invoked in troubled times in the Islamic world. It's less dominant, let's say, in the Wahhabiya sect of Islam, more in the mystical traditions of Islam. So in 1881, Muhammad Ahmad Shah, Say, who wa himself was the leader of a local, you know, Sufi order, proclaims that he has been chosen as the Mahdi, right? And he points to certain signs that were mentioned in the Hadith. Now, the local tribes who were already part of his order accept him as the Mahdi. And that is when, in 1881, he launches what is called the Mahdi state and expands northwards and southwards. Uh, so the Mahdi dies in 1885. But until 1899, his successors rule, right? And in 1899 is when the British send an expeditionary force. They already control Egypt along with Egyptian troops. And in the final battle between the Mahdi's successor and Lord Kitchener at the Battle of Om Darman, right? Om Darman means Mother of Darman. It is now a suburb of Khartoum. That is where the Mahdi's army are finally defeated. And defeated because the British, of course, had better weapons, right, and all. And that's when the British established themselves in Sudan as a ruling power. And it's called a condominium. Technically, the term is condominium means when more than one sovereign power takes control of a territory. So the British do this along with the Egyptian, the Hadavi state of Egyptians whom the British controlled also. And that stays until 1956. It is in 1956 that Sudan gains it. Think of it. The novel comes out in 1966, right? So as we are reading the novel or as it is being compiled, Sudan is still trying to figure out its system of government. What will it do, right? It is struggling with the North-South civil war that immediately launches, right? All of those things are, are the backdrop of the story. So we are reading the story of a remote region of Sudan where the government has barely reached, right? 
But the people still have a living community. They still follow their older customs. While the government is being established and it is, you know, trying to come up with ways of governing and all, that is the time frame within which the story is set, right? Keep that in mind. That's the backdrop to the story. So that's some of the historical and other background. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, I'm going to pause here. If you have any questions, I will answer those. And if you don't have any questions, then I will go into some details in the novel to prove to you as to why we should not read Mustafa Saeed as an analog for African men traveling to Europe and doing certain things. There is, of course, you know, um, a seductive aspect to reading it as a revenge tragedy. There are hints there, you know, where he hints to not just um, Iago, right, or or, or uh, the jealousy part, or, or or the Moors, right. There are hints there, but we have to be very careful in reading Mustafa Said not simply as an outcome of the colonial system, not simply as the exotic African male in Europe, right? Because then we fall prey to the stereotypes that the Europeans already mobilized, right? And there are hints in the novel that suggest otherwise, and it, it's important to be attentive to that. So, okay, I'm gonna stop here and pause and see if you have any questions. I'm trying to go to the my phone to see because sometimes the questions show up quickly there. Okay, so I'm not seeing any comments. Uh, so while you come up with your questions, uh, let me point to why I think, let's see what does Mustafa Said do? Okay, so as we read of his childhood, we already know that he is a genius, right? but he is absolutely incapable of feeling. There is something psychological broken in him. He cannot feel a sense of loss. And quite a few places in the novel, people just consider him that he is pure intellect, right? When he gets a chance to go to school, he far exceeds others in arithmetic, in all the field, aspects of an early education, but he has no social skills, right? So what we are then looking at is a character who isn't just flawed or destructive because of the colonial experience, but who has a psychological problem, right? Who is detached from reality. I mean, all that his mother tells him is no love, but just go this is, this is going to be good for you. And he says that he, he didn't feel a sense of loss. When he's adopted by Mrs. Robinson and her husband, they take care of him, but he is incapable of giving the love back to them. So the character that we are dealing with has deep psychological problems, deep, deep psychological trauma, right? And so we should then get over this stereotype of reading non-Anglo-American novels where a character can stand in for a whole nation and read him as we will read him in an American novel or a British novel as an individual character who has psychological problems. 
the biggest problem that he has is that he cannot relate to anyone. He has no sympathy for anyone. He has no love for anyone. And then as he goes to England, he goes there because he gets a scholarship, because he's brilliant, and his mind is what is being trained. And that's where, if you look at what he does there, none of it is because England made him so. So it's not a heart of darkness story. right? And it's also not a story where he brought that darkness from his culture. No. right? What he does in England is he uses his brilliance to understand how they see him. They see him as this exotic black man, right? This exotic African, all the things associated with that figure. And then he uses those tropes to seduce women, right? We absolutely don't know if he enjoys it. What we do know is that he enjoys the process of the conquest until he reaches the last one, right? Whom he murders, but whom he also marries. What we also know is that he, he creates this persona of, you know, this seductive, virulent African male, right? who is from this wild part of the world, right? But the woman, the first four women who get attracted to him are already predisposed to treating him as a stereotype, right? So he plays with that, right? Offers them that stereotype other than Jean Morris, the woman that he marries. She, you know, she's a problematic figure. She's a problematic figure because she herself is out of control, right? And is not a conformist. And she and him, the relationship that they have is an abusive relationship, is, is a masochistic relationship. But that's the only time when he feels something for her. And the only time he also feels stymied because she's not afraid of him. She, you know, she basically is not enamored with him, right? And the last scene where they consummate their marriage is when he is literally murdering her, right? And that's where she's not even afraid of death. So in so many ways, he has met someone who is his equal and even beyond that. But all these actions that we see are the actions of a, a highly intelligent man who knows how to manipulate others, right? And who is also slightly nihilistic. But we already know that that is the psychological trauma that he had. Miss, Mrs. Robinson's letter tells our narrator, Muzi was the pet name that he used for him, is that, yeah, that they all knew that he was not capable of loving back in a way that people expect, but she still thinks that he was a good man, right? Now, as we see Mustafa Said's life in the village, we already know that he was a loving father and a loving husband. So maybe when he returns to this remote village, he has realized that his wanderings have led him to more and more destructive actions. And this is where he needs to be, an obscure life in a rural family. Now, do keep in mind, he is an economist. He has a PhD in economy. He has given lectures on economics. He has written books on economics. So think of it this way, in opposition to what the usual trend might have been at that time. If you have a foreign degree and your country has just become free, you will have the best chance of coming back and joining the government, becoming a minister and all that, that is what our narrator has done. I mean, you know, he works for the government, he's a high official, but his degree is what? You know, a dissertation on some obscure poet. So Mustafa Saeed doesn't do that. 
So part of it maybe teaches us that he knows what is wrong with him. And maybe the small village by the Nile is the place where he can stop himself from being destructive to others, right? That's how I read it. I am very skeptical of reading the novel as a reverse heart of darkness or because the problem is then that tells us that Tayyib Saleh cannot tell a story without it being referential to a European work. Maybe there are instances where it becomes like that, but I am very reluctant to reading it like that because I think that does a disservice to the originally of, originality of the story itself. Okay. All right, Nadia, welcome. Oh, Shivani, you had a question. Sir, can we say that both Kurtz and Mustafa Said are overpowered by aid and the surrounding in which they live? My first point would be, why compare him to Kurtz? Why do we need to compare Mustafa Said to Kurtz? I mean, if you look at the context of Kurtz, Kurtz is, we know Kurtz is a product of a brutal system. Because he has been sent by a company to Congo to extract ivory, right? There is no law that stops him from doing whatever he wants to do other than the company law. There is greed involved there. And that is why Kurtz, who brought this with him from Europe, goes crazy, right? Part of what Kurtz becomes is because of the colonial system that constructs that kind of a human being, right? If there is no constraint on it, right? Now, how does Mustafa Saeed become Kurtz? I and mean, what does Mustafa Saeed do? We already know that before even he goes and gets adopted by Mrs. Robinson and her husband, right? We know that he's a troubled child. We know that he's detached from other human beings. He has psychological problems. Maybe he's a genius and, and has no social skills. We also know that he knows that, right? So when he goes to Europe and gets his education, He's brilliant. Everyone acknowledges his intellect. But that's when he takes up this persona. And even though he, he becomes this predator, right, and preys upon young women, right, there is no comparison to Kurtz required in reading this person who is so brilliant that he knows how he is being viewed by others right? And then he uses that to prey upon young women who are already attracted to the stereotype of the mysterious Arab, the mysterious Africa, right? And he plays that. What Kurtz does in Africa is just use brute force, right? But my point is, why do that? Why can't we read Mustafa Said? as a self-referential character in a quintessentially North African Arab story, why does he need to be justified in reference to Kurtz? Right? That is my point. Mariam, I didn't get the point of abusing all women in Europe. Would you please tell me your perspective? Thanks in advance. So I don't I guess what you mean is why does he try to conquer as many as possible women in relationships and then killing others? My point is that instead of reading it as a return of an African male and giving to the Europeans what they had done, that is a disservice to the novel and to Tayyip Saleh. We have to train ourselves to read Mustafa Said, not just 
as a conglomeration of a product created by colonialism. There is no evidence in the novel that colonial trauma made him into this. There is the only evidence in the novel is that he was brilliant, he was a genius, and he was educated by the colonial schools. But no one really paused to think about his mental health. So what we are dealing with is a mentally troubled person who is also brilliant, but who feels nothing. And so the only way he feels something is when he is enacting a love ritual, one after the other. But party to that also, I'm not saying the victims need to be blamed, but he chooses his victims carefully. He chooses those he knows will be enticed by the lore of his so-called stereotypical you know, character, what people associate with Africans, what people associate with Arabs. So it's like he looking for women who will fall for something like that. He creates a whole atmosphere of that. The only person who doesn't fall for that is the one he marries, right? And that's when he, me he meets someone who's equally, you know, as detached from real life relationships and the norm as he is, right? And that is what ends in tragedy of he murdering her. Now, we, what we cannot do is read him as, you know, as, as a figure over determined by his experiences. We have to read the individual psychological problems that he has. Now, to further augment that point, think of our narrator. He has gone through the same experience. He has been in London for seven years. He has not done any of these things. Now, the second person who is of the same character with about whom we need to talk about is Wad Rais. Right? So Wad Rais, what does he do? He's a predator as well. Right? He has traveled all along Egypt, Nile, and, and what does he do? Wherever he finds a woman, he marries her, brings her with him, but he constantly is seeking another woman, and that leads him to the most destructive act, just like Mustafa Said, right? But in case of Wad Rais, it is pure, pure desire, right? The first instance, the first story that we hear of him is he raping a young woman. So this guy is also an aberration, right? And that's why when, when he is murdered by Hosna, that's the first time something like that has happened in the village, right? And that's how we ought to read him as this individual male figure who is predatory, right? And makes it a point of pride to go and seek this widow, right? Even though she doesn't want to marry him. And that's where the patriarchal system comes in and the indictment of that. Nadia, can we say that Tayyip Saleh develops a transnational perspective in which he seeks to transcend both cultures, British and Sudanese? Uh, yeah, I mean, both are two huge generalizations. I mean, what is the British culture? If you talk about the British culture, which aspect of it? Is it working class British culture? It is the high British culture, urban, rural. So we'll have to specify which British culture. And then Sudanese, what is it? The culture of North Sudan or South Sudan? Uh, I don't think so. He's trying to transcend anything. What, I'm, what I think is that he's picking up one consciousness of our narrator who has had an experience of Europe as well as is deeply connected to his own village and understands it and then telling a story from that hybrid perspective, right? Where the story is told out of love about the village, but it does not mask all the things that our narrator sees as wrong, both with the British, with the colonial history, but with his own culture. And I think that would be a more perceptive way of reading the novel.
but i wanted to know why is the writer depicting a man of his own country as someone evil um, i mean that why why shouldn't he i mean he's writing a novel right and he's writing a novel in which what what kind of stories do we tell right we tell the stories of love we tell the stories of hate we tell the stories of what goes wrong with the people right so there is no obligation on the author to always write stories that praise the men in his country or not i mean after all if you're writing a novel we already know that there are decent people in the novel the narrator is a very decent human being and then there are villains in the novel what rais is a uh, rais is, is a villain right uh, we don't know if we know that Mustafa Said has done terrible things, but we also know that he would have been capable of doing great things. He was an economist who had published books. So in the end, you know, it's not a story of just an evil person. It's a story of a person who probably had so much promise, but that goes wasted because he does not have the capacity to love, right? And instead, he he develops this capacity to use women right or to abuse women right and that is the consequence of that so it is a tragic novel in that sense but other than that there should be no problem you know in writing bad characters or good characters right Taco, if we cannot say based on the text that Mustafa is a product of his times, colonial policies, then what is the significance of his sexual con conduct in Europe? That's really good question. What I'm saying is that we should not read him as over determined by his colonial experience. Because we have to read the individual hints there that, OK, it is a colonial experience. When he is in Europe, he knows he's a colonized subject. But he also is a genius. But he, so that's where we read some form of determinisms, right? But what we then read is, how does he use it as an individual person, that knowledge and that understanding of that culture, to whatever he wants to do, right? But at the same time, we should also read in it that he was, from the very start, a troubled person. He had a deep psychological problem that he could not relate to other human beings. And if we don't read that individual trauma or individual trait in him, then what we are basically saying is that everything that you are in a colonial system is over-determined by the colonial system. Then there is no room for an individual consciousness there. That's why I think our engagement with it has to be more subtle, right? We can't just say he's a product of colonialism because there are other products of colonialism as well. But what we can say is, that the colonizers used his intellect, saw his intellect, knew of his psychological problems. Would he turn, had he turned out to be a different person if he had gotten some help? I don't know. But we have to account for that individual problem that is foreshadowed for us throughout the story. And he acknowledges it himself as well in his letters and otherwise. Uh, Oshinwani, uh, so please throw some light on why Saleh's narrator is unnamed. I mean, obviously, uh, whatever I say would be speculative. Um, I would say the one main reason the narrator is unnamed is because Saleh, through the voice of the narrator, is trying to help us focus on Mustafa Said, who is the central character. Uh, other than that, I don't know what historical reason would be or what would be the formalistic reason for it. Maybe we can also read the narrator, you know, partially constructed around Tayyip Saleh's own vision. But, you know, I I'm clueless. <laughs> 
it's not like I have any answer to that. So in what I don't see then is the reading of this novel as a post-colonial one. No, absolutely. What we are doing right now is reading the novel as a post-colonial novel. What I'm trying to encourage you to do is don't employ post-colonial over-determinisms. So how is it a post-colonial novel? It is a critique. There is a critique of, you know, the Kitchener invasion, right? And, and there is, of course, a critique of occupation of Sudan. There is a critique of what the government is doing and is not doing. There is a critique of a whole conference, right, in um, held in Khartoum about how to alleviate po poverty by the local and international elite who spent millions of dollars on the conference itself, right, while the peasants, you know, while Majub is saying, well, why don't they build a school here instead of doing the conference on education? So there are critiques of the nation state and the international order. What I'm trying to say, which I also do in every other post-colonial novel, is not to read characters simply or only in their reference to their reactions to colonialism or whatever, because that then makes the colonial experience the central point of, you know, of the agency of the characters. Then we can also read it as an insider critique on the patriarchal nature of the village culture. I mean, why does our narrator almost commit suicide? Because he realizes that, that Hosna's death was partially caused by his indecision. He should have either protected her because in that pro patriarchal order, she needed that protection or married her because he knows he loved her, right? So he feels responsible for it because he knows that he's partially responsible for her death, that, that she had come to her family asking for help, right? And that she had declared to him that if they marry me forcefully to Vadrayas, I will kill myself and I will kill him, right? So all of these are issues that can be dealt with with the, the problems of the native culture itself, right? And not necessarily, you know, problems caused by colonialism, maybe caused by colonialism in a long run because colonialism stymies, you know, the, the sort of cultural progress of nations. So, I mean, I don't know what you mean by post-colonial reading. You know, all I'm trying to say is, don't let that over determine your reading of the novel. So will you upload this video? Yes, the edited version of this video I will um, I will upload infinita. Maybe the reversal of the use performance of the hybridity of pro Protagonist is the most interesting side of the novel. Yes, one of the interesting parts of the novel. Okay, so here is another post-colonial reading that you can do. For Mustafa Said to be able to do what he does in England, right? In terms of his success academically, he needs to prove to them which every post-colonial subject has to do, that he knows his stuff and he has mastered it, right? But then he also is aware, remember, he's hyper-intelligent. He's also aware as to how they see him as a token Arab, right? As a success story, right? And then he plays with that trope. Then you see where he's talking about Abu Nawas and his poetry, there are passages there where he says he just made stuff up. And the reason he can make that stuff up is because he is smart enough to know this is what these people associate with Omar Khayyam. This is what these people, these Orientalists associate with the Arab world, the caravans and all. Knowing that, he reverses that 
by totally, completely lying to them. But in order to do that, he knows that this audience is looking for that. So that reversal is a post-colonial reversal, a conscious reversal, using his status as this exotic other and then playing with that. That's exactly what he does to the women he seduces, right? Think of his den. It's, it's like an exotic place, right? So that is, terrible as it is, is a conscious attempt on his part to play with the tropes of the stereotype that is already existent around him. So we could read it like that. Thank you. How do you move from a post-colonial reading of a source such as this to actually writing a post-colonial critique? That's a really good question. But what this, um, what this question presupposes is that there is one specific way of doing post-colonial critique. I mean, it depends on where you want to come to it from. Right. If you want to do a feminist post-colonial reading of it, you could focus on the rights of women within the village, what happens to them, the patriarchal order, um, the, the hypersexuality. If you want to do post-colonial environmental critique, you could go into what's happening to the River Nile. So what I'm trying to say is that post-colonial critique itself is not a monolithic concept. Right? You have to choose what you want to focus on, and then you see if you can read the novel with that, that kind of lens, right? Taco, could you tell us a bit about your take on the issue of women in the romance, European versus Sudanese women's life, conduct of their fate? How should we understand from Saleh's perspective? So that's really... Uh, a big topic to write about. So, I mean, there are two sets of women's lives. One is their lives in the village, right? So we know that the belief system in the village simply is, even though there is no violence other than the final climactic act of violence, that it's a very patriarchal society. It's a rural society. It's a Muslim rural society where, you know, men, have a dominant place in culture. The women are treated nicely, but when it comes to the point of making a decision, you know, Hosna's case in point, she has no say in whether or not she should marry or not. So we know that it's an unequal relationship. And in so many ways, Saleh is critiquing that because he stages what are the consequences of this in modern life if you marry someone off against her will, right? So the villages are, are shocked because they say this has never happened in our village before. So maybe this is a shock to them that we don't do that. So that's one sphere that he's critiquing, not normalizing, right? And then there is Mustafa Said's life in Europe, right? And over there as well, what does he do? What kind of women does he target, right? and who are his victims, right? And is there a critique of, I, I don't think so that the novel tells us that those were immoral women, no. What the novel tells us is that those were vulnerable women, right? And that Mustafa Said preyed on them. There, it's not necessary that the European women are easy to prey on. It is that those amongst them who were vulnerable, right, were targeted by him and abandoned by him. So in that sense, women in vulnerable situations, emotional and other in Europe, kind of suffer the same fate at Mustafa Said's hand, and women in vulnerable position in a patriarchal society also suffer a similar kind of violent fate. So you could you know, not compare the two, but talk about the predatory actions of men. Mustafa Said in London, Badrayes, in the village. And if you read his character carefully, he is no saint. He didn't have a bout of insanity. He has lived a life where he has seen women only as something to be acquired as objects of desire, right? And he's a particular character, right? Because Majub doesn't do that, right? 
our narrator's grandfather doesn't do that, right? So he is a peculiar kind of male subject, which obviously is not offered to us as, you know, as a good person, right? Okay, uh, Mayar, can we consider Mustafa Saeed victim and victimizer at the same time? I mean, he's a victim of the colonial project and victimizer because what he has done to all women who entered his life. I mean, it's entirely up to you. Uh, I do not see him being over determined by the colonial experience. I see him as someone who is malicious through his own free will. Um, was there some colonial trauma that could have caused it? Maybe, but it's not mentioned in the novel. He is introduced to us as a troubled young man, right? who was incapable of feeling loss or feeling love. So if we read him as that, psychologically damaged, parents not taking care of him, mother letting him go but never expressing her love, right? Just giving him one hug, but he doesn't know what to say to her. He doesn't feel sad when his mother dies and he finds out about it, right? Who does it remind you of? The main character in The Stranger, in Camus' Stranger. So all of these things, what I'm saying is we could read his experience in England as a colonial subject performing a certain identity, but a brilliant colonial subject who knows how the system works, who knows what is expected of him and reverses that, right? But on the other hand, he is a deeply sick person, right? And he knows that. So, but when he comes back, he doesn't stay in Khartoum, right? He comes to this small village, gets married, has children, tills the land, right? But part of his history, he has brought with him. He is created in that one room, which no one else has entered other than our narrator, right? Where he has brought all the relics where he has created this microcosm of the kind of life that he lived, all the remnants of it, the four women who committed suicide because of him, his own wife and her portrait, all the other books that he has read, the books that he has written. So part of it he has brought, right? But he has hidden it. He's also afraid for his sons, right? So he, he encourages the narrator that if something happens to me and you take care of them, please make sure that they don't get the wanderlust because he's worried that what he has done in his life might have been passed on to his children, right? So in that sense then, what I'm saying is, yes, part of it is his colonial experience, but part of it is Tayyip Saleh giving us a character who is a flawed character and who has deep psychological problems, but he's also a genius. And he's also using that genius to extract the most from the colonial system and education, right? Everything else. And then when he is in London, he uses that in a predatory way, right? What he doesn't use it is what a traditional, right, you know, character like him would do. I have a degree in economics. I need to go back to Sudan and I need to give it back to my nation and build my nation. So that inclination is not there. So that's why I encourage you to read him also as an individual character, right? And not just with reference to the West or other novels or other literature. And you'll find articles that will tell you how this is a brilliant novel because its stages are great reversal uh, of Heart of Darkness and all. And I think there is a point to that. But I also think that the novel ought to be written as an Arabic novel set in northern Sudan with characters who emerged during the colonial experience and deal with it differently, right? Mustafa Said being one example and then our narrator being another example and also a novel that kind of shares with us the
the problems and the promises of the farming, the Falahin community, the small village that we are made privy to. So overall, while no novel can carry the burden of an entire culture, we at least get a launch off point to learn more about Sudan, to learn more about its history, and to learn more about Northern Sudan. I mean, there are places in the novel where the local culture is explained to it, right? Where we, we learn in that scene on the desert when he's on the bus, how inhospitable the desert is during the day, right? But as the night falls, everyone comes out of their buses and the Bedouin come and they share, all share whatever they have and dance, right? And so that's also part of this culture. So all of these things, small and large, will enable us to read the novel in its complexity and not necessarily as a response novel or as a novel that we can plot against this European novel or this European novel. And part of the reason I think so also is because if Tayyab Saleh had intended it to be read as a response to Heart of Darkness or anything else. He, he knew English, he could have written it in English, but he decides to write it in Arabic, right? To address his own people, the first audience. So on a side note, uh, please do keep in mind that the first time when he finds out that Mustafa Saeed is not who, who he is, is when Mustafa Saeed immediately starts reading this poem, Those Women of Flanders. So do keep in mind, there is no poem that has all these lines, okay? Uh, the actual poem from which some of these lines come from is a Ford Maddox Ford poem, which is entitled In October 1914, and it was about the First World War. And what the translator has done, which is interesting choice, um, is that, I mean, if you think of it in the Arabic text, this poem, which was in, supposed to be an English poem, Tayyip Saleh must have translated it into Arabic, right? So when the translation later translates it from Arabic to English, instead of giving us the actual verses from Ford Maddox Ford's poem, the translator has dis translated the poem from Arabic back to English. That's why it's so hard to find the poem. So keep in mind that there is no such poem which says those women of Flanders await the lost, await the lost who never will leave the harbor, right? Parts of these lines you can find in Ford Maddox, Maddox Ford's poem. And that's where it is taken from. So overall, I mean, just to conclude, I mean, it's a huge novel, right? There are a few things we, we can take from the novel, right? The life in the Northern Sudanese village, its patriarchal nature, right? The role of women in it, the role of the Nile River and agriculture in it, right? The colonial history of Sudan, its invasion by and capture by Kitchener, Lord Kitchener and his army, the history of the Mahdi's, the corruption of the central government, you know, in Khartoum, which is not doing much for the far-flung villages. So a critique of the post-colonial nation state. And then this figure, highly intelligent Sudanese subject, going to Europe and taking on maybe a predatory role. We can read it as he performing a revenge fantasy or driven by his own psychological weakness or psychological illness. You can read it anyway. Then his return to this obscure village and his death. And then the death of Hosna at the hands of Wadrais. I mean, her murder of him and her suicide as this climactic event that jar us because all they needed to prevent that from happening is to stop Padrais from forcefully marrying this woman. So that's a huge critique of that. 
And other than that, then of course, little gems here and there. So overall, you have a novel that allows you to deal with the issues of colonialism, gender identity, patriarchy, the role of Western education, the need of cross-cultural exchanges that are not mediated through force and violence, right? But also the last lines is what happens to a sensitive narrator who sees all these things and feels hopeless, right? But decides at the very end to give life another try, which in so many ways also makes the novel a very modernist novel because it gives us an unresolved ending. So I'm going to stop here, right? This has been fun. And uh, thank you so much for your questions. And I will announce the next webinar in a couple of days. But, you know, until then, hope you all take care of each other. And as always, peace and love. But I will pause here for a few more seconds and minutes to see if you have any questions or any other any other thing that you need me to answer and if you don't then I will you know ask your lead so Shivani I hope uh, this helped a little I know because you had commented that we should do something on uh, the season of migration to the north so I hope that it has helped all right taco so I didn't welcome you all today, but, you know, some of you are new here and some of you have been here before. So thank you so much for joining me. And uh, so that's all. Thank you all. And I will now see you next time. And OK. Bye bye.